Pak Mokta, it is such a great honor for me to be asked to introduce your book. Pak Mokta is a great man. A Muslim friend of mine once told me that Prophet Muhammad once said that a man's life is to be measured by three things. By his offsprings, by the material things he leaves behind, and by his ideas. And on all three measures, Pak Mokta measures abundantly. He is a great man. His book is full of wisdom. He dedicates it to three persons who shaped his life and influenced him profoundly. First, his father, Li Yamei, then to his teacher, Luo Yitian, and then to his wife, Li Mei. He is a highly methodical man, Pak Mokta. And there is a deep reason why the book is dedicated to these three persons. To his father, because his father was not only a father to him, but also a mother to him, because his mother had died in childbirth when he was still very young. They had gone back to, to Henghua, near Futo, because his grandfather was not well. And for the first six years of his life, he lived there very close to his grandmother. That part of him from his father is deep programming. His sense of being Henghua, for example, comes out throughout the book. His grandmother told him, you must leave in order to come back. You must leave in order to come back to do things for the people here. Years later, he honoured that commitment by building a power station in Meizhou One, a desolate peninsula, but which would improve the condition of the people living in the community, which was his ancestral community. His father taught him many things. Today at the Lee Kuan Yew School, where I'm a visiting scholar, every day I see his beautiful calligraphy. Xiao Kai Da Kai, the father drilled him. Father exposed him to the popular novels like Sang Kuo, and they introduced him to the classics. He's raised in the Confucianist tradition by his father. And then to his teacher, really his primary school principal, Roy Tian, he shaped him politically, exposing him to many things. Once, there were anti-Chinese riots, and he taught Pak Mokta, don't see this in racial terms. It's a result of class divisions, of social tensions, so express in a particular way. Look beyond that. Again and again in the book, the advice of the principal comes out, including when in his fascination with banking, he asked his principal, what is banking? And the principal explained it to him, feeding the hopes, the little flames of a young man. But the most charming account is about how he won over his wife. His wife saved him, literally. He was studying in Nanjing. Then the Civil War broke out. He managed to escape to Hong Kong. And because of the principal law teaching him about social justice, Sam Bing Tu Yi, he became of the left. He wanted to go to Yenan to see what's Yenan. And already booked a seat in a ship 
to take him to Tianjin, I think. But the love of his life, Li Mei had already gone back to Indonesia, waiting for him. And as it turned out, her letter appeared saying, I'm waiting for you. So at the last moment, he decided not to go to Yenan. And that ship was sunk, and everyone on board died. So the wife saved him. But not just him. It was the wife, Li Mei, who kept the family together. There's an anecdote about how, because they're all Li, so there was taboos on both sides. And he had to ask the wife's mother to agree. That anecdote, you must read for yourself in the book, because it is delicious. <laughs> Once he came back, someone had given him four gold bars. He was quite excited, having, not having seen gold bars before. The wife said, please, return them. You do not want to be obligated. Which was also the advice his father had given him. And then he had another part in the book where he said, any member of the family who did not grow up straight, the wife would wear them down until they became straight. <laughs> so, without his father, without his teacher, without his wife, there is no life story to talk about. And that's why the book is so dedicated. The book talks about his various business ventures. And as a study in management, he, he reduces great complexities to great simplicities. There's a chapter when he moved in to take over Bank Central Asia. And his business principles can be reduced to three things. One is you need an archival system. The first thing he did was to clean up the records and to find out what was happening. Then he mastered accounting, accounting system. Because without that, we do not know what's happening. And I think anyone studying accounting should first read his, his view of accounting. Because he says it is not dry bones, numbers, figures. It, it, it is a mind view of information about a company. In the accounts, you can find out everything. And his third principle is, and he's obsessed with it, and you can see in the way he's crafted the book and structured it, is in analyzing the workflow. Analyzing the workflow, the work process. For him, whether it is in shipping, in banking, in properties, in nanotechnology, in biology, in globalization, Analyze the workflows, find out what's happening, find out in what's happening opportunities for yourself. So these three things, archival systems, accounting systems, and workflows. He talks about leadership. And he's gone through ups and downs. There's in him, deep inside, and you can see it throughout his book, three wellsprings, deep anchors, which make him what he is. His Chineseness, his sense of being Henghua, being educated in the Confucianist tradition and in the Taoist tradition. A sense of China, of obligation to his origins, to people who helped him in the course of his life. That Chineseness, without that Chineseness in him, you can't explain Pak Mokta Riyadi. Then, there is his sense of being Indonesia, because he is anak Indonesia, born in Batu, outside Malang, where even till today his parents are buried. A deep sense of obligation. He talks about how in Malang, he converted a cemetery into a memorial park. A beautiful thing. Despite initial local opposition, this sense of being from East Java, 
from being of Indonesia. It's profound in him. And he was involved in the idea of Indonesia from a young age. His sense of revulsion against Dutch colonialism. Then, during the revolution, supporting the local commander from Malang, Commander Imam Sukarto, who later became a general, doing reconnaissance, supplying stuff to the little units, taking great risks as a teenage revolutionary. And then his life as a reflection of the ups and downs of the Indonesian revolution, of Indonesian nationalism through the Sukarno era, the Suharto era, and the post-Suharto era to the world that we have today. You know, Pak Mota is most comfortable when he's in the batik, not when he's in a suit and tie. That's him as an Indonesian, being Chinese, being Indonesian, and being Christian. I did not know that it was James and the other children who converted him to Christianity. I thought it was the other way around until I read the book. And initially, it was just to please them, as he said, to keep family relations together. So he attended classes. Then he had to go for surgery. And then he got baptized. And in his methodical way, first the archives, then the accounting system, and then the workflows, he went deep into Christianity. And he said, in my entire family, we keep together because we're all Christians. He's very proud of it. And you cannot explain him without that Christian side of him. Before the Asian financial crisis, James invited me to Karawachi, me and my wife. And I was quite surprised how the hospital was called Siloam and how they did not hide their Christian beliefs. But it was not a narrow Christian belief. He's not a narrow Chinese chauvinist. He's not a narrow Indonesian nationalist. He's not a bigoted Christian. In all his deep beliefs, he has a big heart. And because he has a big heart, there's no contradiction for him being Chinese, being Indonesian, being Christian. In fact, they all reinforce one another. And this is the story of the new Indonesia, of an embracing Indonesia, which is cooperating with China along one belt, one road, which is now a key anchor in the Asian century. This book is a book about many things. It is a reflection of periods of history. And it is the story of a man who has gone through a lot, who floated with the tide, and whose greatness is, out of all this, to create the three things I talked about earlier. A wonderful family, a business empire which sees its principal responsibility in stewardship and in philanthropy. Pelita Harapan, light and hope, always. Universitas Pelita Harapan, Sekolah Pelita Harapan. And in being responsible to the people who work within, in being responsible to a larger community, to people in Malang, to people in Singhua, in, in, in Penghua, to the people of Indonesia, to the people wherever the company operates. It's a book full of treasures, full of insights, and I invite everyone here to profit from them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Giorgio.